Okay, it's 1210. Time for us to get started. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce our seminar speaker for today, Urban Nesselink uh, from the Netherlands. I think many of you have probably written uh, or read a little bit about what has been written about Urban. He got his degree uh, working with Joop van Lenteren at, at, at Wageningen University. And many of you may know of, of Joop, but basically uh, Joop van Lenteren really uh, advanced biological control in greenhouses around the world and he had a, a tremendous stable of students that now are, are again around the world still advancing biological control. Uh, Urban is one of them. After his degree he worked a little bit uh, with a plant diagnostic firm in the Netherlands both uh, insects and nematodes. Kind of got bored of doing that and they moved into a research position at Nalvik, which is uh, an experiment station very famous for developing biological control strategies for vegetable crops in the Netherlands and, and around the world. And uh, if people that know anything about biocontrol in greenhouses, the name Nalvik uh, you know, basically comes, comes to mind because of the tremendous advances that have been made there. There have been some major changes in the Netherlands uh, over the years. There used to be a research station at Alsmeer. Uh, and then one at Nalvik, Alsmeer did floriculture, Nalvik did vegetables, they've kind of combined them. Uh, Herbin has sort of moved into a new, new position where he is, uh, uh, well, a new location, I guess, basically, where he is senior uh, research scientist and he does biological control, or practical biological control for uh, the greenhouse industry, both vegetables and ornamentals in, in the Netherlands. He's a well-published researcher, uh, and again, the focus is sort of uh, Natural, understanding natural enemy biology and ecology with the idea of uh, making uh, use of these natural enemies in an, in an applied context. And he works across a broad range of different systems, and I think you'll see some of that in his uh, presentation today. So, Yes, thank you very much, Mike, also for this invitation. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me very well. Is it okay? All right. Um, so today I would like to tell something about the role of generalist predators in biological pest control. Because in the past, I think we used, a bit, uh, we used to focus a bit more on, on the specialist natural enemies, and it has shifted a bit more toward the use of generalist predators. Move that up a little higher. Yeah. We'll see if you can. Is this better? Sorry. Not really. Not really. No. <laughs> and if I speak loud, is that better? That's better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Try to speak now. Not to shout. All right. So today I would like to tell something about uh, well these types of natural enemies, generalist predators in biocontrol. And my name is Gerben Messling. So uh, first of all, I work at Wageningen University and Research Center. It's a combination of uh, applied research stations and the university. I'm in the plant science group here. Excuse me, one more time. Let me just see that. Let me replace the battery. science group. Um, something about agriculture in the Netherlands. Horticulture is really important. I'm working in the greenhouse sector, but uh, it's an important industry. About 70% of uh, the production value is, is caused by, by cre is, is, uh, is greenhouse industry. Well, this is the Netherlands. We are a very small country in Europe, uh, close to the coast. Um, but we uh, have about 10,000 hectares of greenhouse industry and it's mainly located in, the, in this area. It's called the Westland and also our research station is in this area where all the industry is. Um, it's about 50% floriculture and 50% vegetables. And there are also some other areas where they produce the greenhouse industry. But also here, it was in the past more floriculture and here more vegetables. 
these are the important areas. Um, my research station is located in Blijswijk, uh, and part of our group is working in Wageningen. And our mission is to initiate and stimulate innovations for a sustainable greenhouse sector. It's both strategic and applied research. And we have about 80 researchers all working in this greenhouse industry. In Blijswijk, it's a location where I'm, where I'm working. We have about 19 greenhouse compartments where we do all kinds of experiments, uh, crop protection laboratories, flavor, taste facilities, uh, and we also have an innovation and demo demonstration center for greenhouse as energy source. So there's a lot of research going on in energy saving and greenhouses. And they want to switch from energy consuming industry to energy producing industry. So that's quite challenging, there's a lot going on. But I will not tell something about that today. It's about IPM, biological control. Uh, our funding, it's mainly based, uh, it's project based funding. Uh, a lot of funding comes still from the government, Ministry of, of Economic Affairs. Um, it's about 50%. Uh, but we are a privatized institute. So. And uh, a lot of funding is coming from the, what you call the produce board. Uh, 30% and some other funding, European community, private companies. Well, something about the greenhouses. Uh, it's mainly, uh, well, high-tech greenhouses, glass houses we have, uh, not so much tunnels. And they, they appear very sterile. If you look at this uh, tomato production, it, it's uh, all in hydroponics, not in a soil. And it looks really clean, and it is also clean. Uh, and this is an example of uh, a nice grower who's producing a sweet pepper with artificial light, so it looks really nice. But although, although uh, the greenhouses are really closed and it's high tech, somehow always pests appear. And we have uh, <laughs> the common pests you probably also have, or I'm sure you also have uh, the white flies, and we have frips coming in, one of the big problems both in vegetables and ornamentals. Um, we have aphids that appear, and we have spider mites that blow into your crop somehow. And yeah, just for those who are not so familiar with these pests, this is uh, thrips, western flower thrips. We call it the Californian thrips, so it came from California <laughs> somehow. Uh, in the past, that's the story. Um, yeah, but it's a huge problem in, in many crops. Uh, it also transmitted viruses. We have white flies, greenhouse white fly mainly, also Bemisia, but uh, this is the most important uh, white fly. Uh, so this is a lot of honeydew excretion, a lot of problems. Spider mites, uh, leaf miners, we have a lot of aphids. Um, yeah, a big problem in, in pepper is uh, the green peach aphid. And the, the green peach aphid had also red phenotypes, biotypes, and they go immediately to the flowers. So what happens is that the flowers drop, you lose production, they excrete a lot of honeydew. So this is a big problem in the organic pepper industry. It's very hard to control. Another important aphid species are the Quattrocellani, the foxglove aphids. Uh, you can see these strange symptoms of the on the leaves, a, a strong response of the plant, and when there are high densities, the, the plant just drops the leaves. So there's nothing more than just the stem. So, so not, a lot of uh, production, uh, loose of production. We also have bugs, lichens, uh, different species that you have, but also can be a problem in vegetables and ornamentals. Uh, tomato rust mite, it's an increasing pest species. Uh, top pesticide, that's a uh, mistake here uh, but you can see here the the brown coloration and here when you close up they're really tiny mites but so far we don't have any solutions for this we have leaf, leaf miners and one of the uh, increasing pest species is the leaf miner moth tuta absoluta it's a big problem in southern Europe but also it occurs also in northern Europe and we have all kinds of uh, Caterpillars, Prisodaxis is one of the main species. So, well, uh, bi biocontrol is on a pretty high level in some vegetables, but there's also uh, a lot going on in ornamentals. And tomorrow we have this meeting, also a growers meeting, 
there was a fill for uh, floriculture, and that's a big challenge. Um, so, and there are several uh, things that drive the change to, uh, to, to biological control. Uh, with environmental pollution, emission of pesticides to the surface water. We have a lot of surface water in the Netherlands, so that's a big issue. Resistance of pests against pesticides. So, sometimes we growers are just not able anymore to control pests with pesticides, so they have to change to biocontrol control or other options, control measures. The number of pesticides is also reduced, um, and uh, when we talk about the vegetables, there is a strong demand for uh, residue-free products. So it has to be cleaner and without pesticides. So a lot of growers now really, if you want to supply some retailers, you have to produce without insecticides. So that's a big challenge. Um, well, <coughs> biocontrol in, 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 uh, in greenhouse crops has been applied for a long time, and there is a list of about uh, 30 species that are released worldwide, worldwide in greenhouse crops. And among them are specialists, the parasitoids, uh, or specialist predatory mice, like Pathocyrus pessimilis, a well known, uh, it's very important predator, specialist aphid predators, specialist. Uh, Entomopathogenic fungi or nematodes, nematodes or uh, parasitoids. Um, and then we have the generalists. So that's what I would like to talk today about. And those are predatory mites, predatory bugs, and predatory beetles. Um, yes, and recently, uh, last year, there came a paper by Joop van Lenter. It was telling us about the state of commercial augmentative biological control. And he uh, mentioned that there are worldwide about 230 species used for biological control. And about 25 species of them dominate the market, about 90% of the market. And of that market, about 75% is, is mainly the greenhouse industry in Europe. In the Netherlands, France and Spain, those are the important countries where they use these biological control agents. And, um, from those 25 species, about six of them are uh, generalist predators that are widely applied. So, here's some pictures of those generalist predators. This is a predatory mouse, Omnicyus whisky. It's a very important one. It feeds on both white fly. These are white fly eggs, you can see, sucked empty. And this is a thrips larvae killed by swiski. This is aureus meuscus feeding on aphids. It also feeds on on thrips, on wildflies, all kinds of pests. Really a generalist. Macrolophus pygmaeus is a myriad predatory bug, a very important one. Uh, it's similar to uh, the cypher species we, you have here, or uh, Nesiochorus, used in southern Europe. Also a generalist feeding on all kinds of prey. In the, it was mainly used in the past for wildfire control, but it also uh, attacks spider mites and um, other pest species, aphids. And we have the salt bedding predatory mites. This is Hypoaspis, feeding on the beetle larvae. It's kind of crook feeding. It's very fascinating to see. So to summarize, we have different crop species, different crops, and different pest species. And you can, well, if you summarize in one table, you can see that we have the, the predatory mites. This is only the generalist predators that are used. The predatory mites, phytocyte species that are leaf dwelling, yeah used in all kinds of crops. But then we have the Antopera bugs. They really need pollen often to establish, so they do very well in sweet pepper, flowering crop, but not so well in tomato. Tomato has glandular hairs, so they have problems with this. Cucumber, they don't establish. Um, and they are, they are trying to use these predators also in, in, in ornamentals, in roses, chrysanthemum. The mirrors are mainly used in pepper, tomato, eggplant, they like the hairy plants, and they also can feed on the pollen in, in pepper. And then we have the salt dwelling predators. They are mainly used in, in the ornamentals, because the other crops are grown in hydroponics and rock wool, so they don't establish there. So now my question, what is the role of these generous predators in biocontrol? Uh, why do we use them? And what are the benefits and disadvantages? And what types of interactions can they they can be involved in. 
how do they act in complex food apps? So that, those are things I would like to discuss. Well, some benefits. I think a big benefit is the preventive releases you can do, uh, inoculative releases. So you, you can start your crop with releasing these parasites. The, the, the nicest example is sweet pepper, where you have young plants, as soon as they start to flower, they produce pollen and nectar, and you can release predatory mice, predatory bugs, and they can establish, even without the presence of pests. And they can build up populations to high levels. So after a while, when, when, when the pests appear, your, your natural enemies are already there in your crop, waiting for the pests, and then they can control them very nicely. So we call it the standing ar army principle. Your, your army of natural enemies should be ready in your crop, waiting for the pests. And they can attack multiple pest species, different pest species. That's a big advantage. You don't have to release for each pest a new natural enemy. So it's, it can be a simple system. And uh, you can promote them with alternative food sources. Well, but there are also some disadvantages, maybe. Um, they can feed on other natural enemies. They are dead generalists, but they also attack some natural enemies that you don't want to. So we have to find out how bad that is for biocontrol. Some, sometimes they have a slow generation time, a slow numerical response. And if you look back to the first selection criteria uh, that were developed for selecting natural enemies for biocontrol, they always liked, said, well, you, have to need, you need natural enemies with, with a short generation time, so they can respond very quickly to, natural, to a pest species. And that often is not, not the case when you use uh, predators like predatory bugs that are really need a lot of time for a new generation. And there can be some switching behavior. Because they are generalists, they can prefer maybe some other pest or food, which is not the target pest you want to control. So that may be bad for control. And uh, there's a discussion about the environmental risk, the effects on non-target organisms. Well, so uh, what I told at the beginning, we are switching a bit more from, from specialists. No, we had the simulus for, for spider mite control and Karsia for wildfly control, and we had this cucumerus, which was also considered as more or less a specialist and thrips control. And we now switch to, to predators that control them all. And this is, uh, for example, Ambrisaeus whisky that feeds both thrips, wildflies, and spider mites. And that's interesting because you can uh, control them both, but you also get all kinds of interactions. And there's also theory about this, a theory by Holt about apparent competition, and it predicts that uh, there will be a lower equilibrium density of a prey when of prey when there's a sharing predator. So uh, one prey species has a lower density finally when there's also another prey present because they because of the higher predator density. But there's also a risk apparent mutualism. On the short term, you might have these, these switching behavior and, and prey may escape from control because they are feeding on the other prey and that might be worse for control. So I'll just show you now an experiment where we, we explore this. Uh, and this was an experiment done in greenhouses on cucumber with thrips, wildflies or the combination. And we both released in all greenhouse compartments this mite, Omnicide Swiskii. We had separate greenhouse compartments. So you can see here, each compartment has its own door. Um, and we had several replicates. Well, if you, here are the results. Here I show you the, shown the, the population development of thrips in time. In, in the case when there's only thrips and the predatory mites, or thrips plus wildflies and the predatory mites. And you see that in both cases, actually, thrips gets very nicely under control. So there's no negative effect of the presence of wildflies on the control of thrips. But if you look at the effects on wildflies, it was really surprising me that here, you see that when there's only wildfly present, it increases. So we did not include the control with, with, without predatory mites. So there, there might be an effect on the wildflies, but it's not enough. It's not able to control the wildflies. But in a situation when there's also thrips present, you see a very nice control. So it's a very clear difference. And an explanation for this is, is the much higher predatory mite densities in the case when both pests are present. 
So here you can see this line is when both bus flies and frips are present. And these are the peritomite densities of the star. So when there's only frips or only white flies, these are densities per leaf, so it's still quite high. But, but when they are both present, you see these amazing densities of more than 100 peritomites per leaf. So peritomites are everywhere. And we also try to find out, well, what is the reason for these extremely high densities of peritomites when both pests are present? And we checked that in the, lab in the laboratory, where we uh, looked at the development from egg to adult, and how fast the development is, and how, how many juveniles uh, will die during this process, so the, the mortality. And you can see here that when the mixture is present, in seven days, 25 degrees, they all reach adult stage, and there was no mortality, whereas when there uh, was only FRIPS present, we have more <coughs> mortality, and there's a, a slower developmental rate, and this is the case with only white flies, with about 40% mortality, and it's also slower. So this shows that these predatory mites, they are generalists, but uh, also that they have a benefit by mixing their diets. They develop faster and they control the pest better. And we did another experiment, included another pest species, which is spider mites. And also again, we found the same thing. If you try to control the spider mites with only this predatory mite, it won't succeed because it cannot <coughs> enter the, the dense webbing of, of spider mites. But if you have a preventive release of these predatory mites, and they can build up populations on thrips and wildflies, then we saw a nice control of spider mites. So this is the, the percentage of leaves damaged by spider mites in the case when also thrips and wildflies are present. And this is when, when there are only thrips present, only wildflies present. So here you can see actually that the more diverse the prey uh, diet is, the more pests are present, the better the control is also of, of thrips and uh, of uh, spider mites. So these are my conclusions about, uh, about these effects. So they develop better on a mixed diet, and this might be an uh, important uh, general principle for general respirators. And the pest control of a specific pest species can be enhanced by the presence of another pest species when these pests share a predator. Okay. Well, another advantage I showed at the beginning is that you can promote them with alternative food sources. And we checked this for uh, this mirrored predatory bug, which is very important in tomato. Um, so we released on single plants 10, 12 couples of, of predatory bugs. And this is the offspring. About 10 couples uh, after three weeks. And you see here, when you only have a tomato plant, the offspring is very low. Whereas if you add some food or prey, this is the case when white flies are present, they reproduce much more um, new predators. And um, so they are able to establish on plants without prey. And they can reproduce, but, but not, not so well. And these are the cases where you added an alternative food sources. The Fescia eggs, it's a uh, eggs of the floor mod. The, uh, these are also used for mass producing these natural enemies. Or pollen, or uh, pret feed, it's a product. Or Artemia cysts, those are cysts of the shrimp. Uh, it's used for feeding fish, but you can also use it for feeding the predators. So we also did the next step, we went to commercial growers and uh, applied these food sources um, by spraying them, blowing them with a hand blower here. And we checked uh, how well the predators develop when you apply weekly these food sources. And here you can see, I'm not sure whether you can see it right, but here you see the red dots, which are the, the, the cysts of Artemia. And here you can see the, the nymphs of uh, Macrolocus, they call it red. So they really uh, feed on these food sources. And when we checked the, the increase of populations uh, of the predators, when there's no food present, or you added Ephesia X or Atemia cyst, you can see here that they do much better on these uh, plots where we added the food sources. I have to say that we added uh, five times more Atemia compared to Ephesia, because at the graph I showed you that Ephesia is a much better food source, but 
but Artemis is are much cheaper. It's about 20 euro per kilogram, whereas Hephaestia is about 800 kilogram per kilogram, euro per kilogram. I don't know in dollar, it's not. Uh, about a thousand, I think. Um, so it's very expensive. Um, and this shows that with a <coughs> higher dose of a cheaper food source, and you're still much cheaper, um, then you had a better result in the establishment. So this is something the growers are actually applying now. Almost every tomato grower is now using this uh, Artemia to uh, promote the establishment of the, net, of the predators at the beginning of the, of the season. So they, they start planting, they release the predators, try to keep on feeding them till spring and then they stop. And then the pests come in and then your predators are ready to control your pests. So we also studied uh, the possibilities for, uh, for feeding predatory mats with several food sources. And here we show the overposition rates of Amnesia whisky. When you feed them with cattail pollen, it's Tifa latifolia, uh, or corn pollen, or these Hephaestia eggs, sterilized eggs, and Artemia cyst. And you can see that they, do, they develop very well on these food sources, but not so well on Artemia, somehow. So this pity because it's a cheap food source, but anyway, they do well on the other food sources. But, um, well, these predatory mats are used to control thrips, and thrips actually is a pest, but also an omnivore. It also feeds not only on the plant, but also on uh, other food sources. They, they also uh, feed on spider mite eggs, and they also feed on pollen. It's, it's a western flower thrips. So if we add pollen to chrysanthemum leaves, or these the same food sources, and we also check the overposition rate of thrips. And then you see also an increase of overposition rate. So these are the treatments with all the food sources, the same food sources, and this is the control with only the plant, and this is Artemia. So what you see actually is that the same food sources that do well with the predatory mats are also very suitable for the, for the pests, the thrips. So we did not succeed in selecting a food source which is more suitable for the predator than for the pest. That was the idea, but we did not succeed. Another issue is when you pr provide food sources, it will also affect the predation uh, rate of the predators on thrips. And this after three days, you see that when you add pollen to thrips, that the predation rate is going down. So uh, we have a low predation rate, and we also have seen that the, the pest also develops on these food sources. So the big question is what will happen if you apply these food sources in the crop? Will it promote bio control or will it worsen bio control? Well, that's what we tested, just on simple experiments, on single plants, in, in cages, where we added the food sources, the thrips, the predators. And here are the results. You can see the development of the predatory mites, and these arrows indicate the application of food. And here you can see that, well, the predators, they establish, but not so well in chrysanthemum. chrysanthemum is Somehow they, they do not develop that fast as a crop like cucumber uh, in the presence of thrips. But when you add the food source, the cattail pollen, you see that the, the densities go up to much higher, much higher densities. And it also goes down again. So the, this indicates also that the food quality is going down after a while. So you might need to apply more food. So what will happen with, with the thrips? Well, you might expect that uh, the, thrips is also, the food are, sources are also suitable for the thrips, that you have at the beginning higher thrips densities. That's what we expected. And so on the short term, we also see this, but the effect is, uh, is not that big. The difference is not that big. In some situations, like Fessia, we see a, we see a bit higher density of thrips compared to the control. But soon, very soon, this changes to a better to lower thrip densities compared to the control treatment. So this indicates that there, there might be a, on the short term uh, a negative effect on applying food to thrips. You yeah, might on the short term have a bit higher thrip densities, but it soon changes in lower thrip densities. And probably because there is a strong numerical response of the predators to the food sources. And they have also a relatively short generation time compared to other generous predators like the bugs they need much more time, but these predatory masses can develop, well, I showed you in the graph from 25 degrees, 
within seven days, seven to ten days, they develop from egg to adult. So very soon you have a new generation and you have a strong response to the food. So my conclusion about this is, think, yes, we, 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 can, we can use alternative food sources to promote peritoneal mice and also to enhance thrips control. And uh, yes, we, well, we should try to select just the best, the most suitable food for us for the, for the predator. And uh, although these food sources are also suitable for the, for the best, it still enhances control. Well, what are, these are all advantages of using generalist predators. Uh, they attack multiple pests, you can you have preventive releases, uh, you can promote them with alternative food, but there are some drawbacks. Uh, a potential disadvantage is hyperpredation. And this is also an example. Example: There are many studies done on, with generalist predators, interkill predation. But in the case of interkill predation, they also always share prey. So the eventually effect on biocontrol is not always that dramatic. Uh, but in the case of hyperpredation, it's like hyperparasitism. It can really disrupt your biocontrol. And this is what we observed when we started the biocontrol of aphids with a specialist, predatory mids, this species there, it drops eggs near aphid colonies, and from these eggs you have these larvae that feed on the aphids. But what we observed many times in the field that some eggs were empty, they were predated, and we also observed that predatory mice were walking around there, and they turned red after feeding on these eggs. So we observed them feeding on these eggs. So we tested also in several experiments what the effect is of predatory mice on the biocontrol of thrips of aphids with this predatory mids. So we released predatory mids in a greenhouse and we added uh, aphids to plants and some plants were treated with predatory mites and some not. Here we see actually a rearing sachet with predatory mites and the Swiss key coming out and you see the clear differences on the plants Without predatory mites, we had a very good control of the aphids with these predatory mids. And in this case, when the predatory mites were present, the mids was not able to control them. And we also did this in experiments. You can see it that the densities of aphids, in the case when these mites are present, are much higher compared to when there are no aphids present. And also, the number of mids larvae is much lower in the case when Swiski is present compared to the treatments without predatory mites. Something weird is going on. After a while, when you have a worse control of aphids, you get higher aphid densities, and the predatory mist is responding to that. So even when the predator, predatory mites are present, they keep on dropping eggs near those aphid colonies. So they respond very strong to the, to the higher aphid densities. So that's why you find higher densities of eggs of these predatory mites on the places where the predatory mice are also present. But very clearly, these uh, predatory mice disrupt aphid control. Well, so there are several types of interactions where these predators are involved in. And one question is, well, what happens when several types of interactions occur within one food web? And this is an example in sweet pepper, where we have both aphids and thrips important pet species. So for aphids we use these parasitoids and these predatory mites I showed you. And for thrips we can use predatory mites and we use predatory bugs. But if we use these bugs they both feed on thrips and aphids. And these predatory mites, uh, well, this predator is really a generous predator. It also feeds on, on parasitized aphids or on larvae of this mix. It also feeds on the predatory mites. And what I showed, this predatory mite also feeds on the eggs of this mix. So there are already, although it's a rather simple food uh, compared to uh, outdoor, it's still a lot of interactions you have. Well, this is to show you that this generalist predatory bug, when you offer them both thrips and aphids, uh, this is only thrips, predation rates, only aphids, this is the mixed diet that they still feed both thrips and aphids. So um, there's not, not a strong preference.
So um, we have these interactions, and for for giving advice to a pro, which the nice thing about uh, greenhouses is that you actually can build your own ecosystem. You can decide which natural enemies you can release or not, and and that way you can optimize biocontrol. So here we compared two th strategies. So you have to control thrips and aphids. In this case, you have to release. Yeah, it's very common to release uh, parasitoids and respiratory mites. But if you use respiratory mites to control thrips, you have this negative effect on, the, on these mites, this hyperpredation. In the other case, when you release this, use these respiratory bugs, you have this intracule predation interactions. But these respiratory <coughs> bugs also feed on thrips and aphids. So there are different types of interactions. <coughs> And when we compare these strategies in greenhouses, separate greenhouses, and we follow the dynamics of both thrips and aphids, you can see very nicely that here is the aphid control, but we had a very good control of aphids in the strategy where we, where we released, where we added the predatory bugs. And this is the case where you have only parasitoids and predatory mites. And this is the case where you add the predatory mites. So with the predatory mites, it goes to much higher densities. And this is the situation with thrips. Also here, we had a better control of thrips uh, in the case when the predatory bugs were present. So this is a uh, yeah, conclusion of these studies, is that there are, although there are potentially negative effects of intrakill predation, these can be compensated by positive effects, like um, a strong effect on shared prey apparent competition. Uh, we have this establishment prior to the pest. So intercule predation not ne doesn't necessarily to have, to have to be bad for biocontrol. Well, we were a bit encouraged by using general inspirators for aphid control, because so far the crows were mainly using the specialists, the parasitoids, the lace wings, the, the, the oxynellid predators, uh, but not general respiratory bugs. So we compared three species, Oris levigatus, which is mainly used for threat control, or is musculus, what I showed you before. And there's another one, this myriad predatory bug, which I was used so far mainly in tomato, but you can also release them in pepper, and it will feed in the flowers on the pollen and the nectar. You can see them here. So we compared these three species, and we followed the development of aphids. Well, after a while, we had these results. You can already see here that in the case of Lepigatus, there were a lot of uh, aphids. We had a few aphids and it stayed clean when Macrolocus was present. And here are the results in the graph. Again, here, they've got this musculus, and this is Macrolocus. These are the aphid densities in time. So we had them. Yeah, so this is the case when you first release your parameters, and then we release several times aphids, and we saw that well, the aphids were actually not able to establish in the crop when we have these high densities of myriad predatory bugs, which is very interesting. Um, however, thrips is the other pest species often present, and, and we saw that Macrolovis was not a good thrips predator, or it is doing much better in controlling thrips. So here we summarize the damage, we measured on the fruit, and this is, uh, so the blue bars is the damage by thrips, you can see here, you can see here the damage by thrips is much higher compared to Aureus. And this is damaged by honeydew, secreted by the aphids. So, so the very little damage by aphids in the treatment with Macrolophus, but here it's very high. So the next question is, well, what happens when you combine two species of general respiratory bugs? We thought, well, maybe you can combine the, the Macrolophus for controlling thrips, uh, aphids, with aureus feeding on the thrips. But then you also get all kinds of interactions, intrakill predation, competition. So what will happen? So we had this food web, and now we add another predator. <coughs> it's a mirrored predatory bug. And we get all kinds of interactions, so it gets really complex. Um, well, let's first focus on the interaction between these two predatory bugs, the Macrolophus and Aureus, and the two prey species, aphids and thrips. So Macrolophus feeds on aphids, it's a good predator of aphids. It also feeds on thrips, but to a, a lower extent. And the opposite for aureus, it's a 
good straight further, it also feeds on aphids, but much less. And then they both feed on the pollen and nectar in the flowers, so they also might compete for food in the flowers or for space. And there is also an, a negative interaction of intercule predation. So the adults of Aureus also feed on the nymphs of Macrolopus. We never observe the opposite. So by using these two parameters, you get already all kinds of possible interactions. And it's interesting to see how, how that develops in the crop. So we did these greenhouse trials in separate uh, compartments with a sweet pepper, pepper crop. And we released, inoculated the crop with aureus, macrolobus, or both parasites. And then we released thrips, followed by a. <coughs> and we followed that for about 12 weeks. And here we see the results. This is development of aphids. And here we can see the treatment where on only aureus is present, that the aphids increase to high densities. Whereas if you have macrolobus present in the mixture, or macrolobus alone, if it's scanning under control very nicely. And this is the other result, thrips. In the case when only macrolophus is present, you can see here higher densities of thrips. And this is the other treatment when, o when only is included, uh, oris is included in the treatment, you have very nice control of thrips. So it seems that when you combine both thrips, both aureus and macrolophus, you have an excellent control of both uh, aphids and thrips which is quite nice. Well, <coughs> it's also important to know well, how well they establish in the crop. Of course, they might compete. So one predator might exclude another predator after a while. And we started this. And if you look at the densities, you can see here, this is, are the densities in the flower. Well, first it's clear that Macrolophus reaches much higher densities than Aureus. But <coughs> you can see that there is not really a difference. The densities of Macrolophus are not really affected by the presence of Aureus. And the also for aureus, we found a bit lower densities of aureus when macrolophus was also present, but it's, uh, they are both established. So they seem to be okay together. So the conclusion, intracul predation by aureus leafhounds did not affect the coexistence, at least measured during this time of the, of the, prep, of the experiment. We also measured in the commercial greenhouse uh, for much longer, up to eight months, and we could find them back both after eight months. So it seems that they coexist for a while, um, and the combined treatment gave a be better control of both thrips and aphids. Well, so we had this very good result in our experiments, but sometimes in practice it's different. What we observed is that sometimes when you have an outbreak of aphids, there's a lot of honeydew present. And uh, these myriads seem to feed also on the honeydew. And that also affects the effect on, on the prey. So, yeah, it's nice to work with these omnivores, but sometimes you're, you have surprising results because you, you cannot really predict sometimes how they behave. It's flexible behavior. They might switch from plant feeding to prey feeding to honeydew feeding. So it's sometimes hard to understand, but it's uh, very interesting. And we try to understand this. Um, how it works. Ah, so this is a short movie, but I'm not sure it, whether it works. Yes, it works. Yeah, so here you can see a Macrolophus has been attacking an aphid, but uh, there is a risk of attacking aphids. It has, it's defending itself with honeydew and it can stick to the stylus. So after a while, it's only, uh, it's not predating on aphids anymore, but just cleaning the stylet, <coughs> the poor cow. Yeah, so these things happen as well. So to summarize about the generalist predators in greenhouse control, I think they are very important in addition to specialist natural enemies. Uh, and yeah, they deserve more attention in research. Uh, also in our search for new natural enemies. Um, so instead of selecting natural enemies for each pest species, I think we should much more select natural enemies that are more crop adapted and, and predators that prey on multiple prey. But uh, yeah, we need to understand their behavior in realistic food webs. So 
So greenhouse trials are really important, not only lab studies, but see what's going on in the field and how they act when there are multiple pest species present and, uh, and also uh, other natural enemies. So um, when selecting a natural enemy, a predator, for controlling one pest, it's important to include also other pest species that are normally present in that crop. Because it can be totally different how well they uh, control that pest species when the other pest species are also present. We saw this example with wildflies, with spider mites, it's the same counts for aphids, so it's really important. So this is really an area I really would like to continue on. I'm really <coughs> enthusiastic about genderless predators. And our future work is also yeah, what I told you. It's about evaluating new species for crops, big crops, with huge challenges for ornamental crops, roses, chrysanthemum, gerbera. And also we would like to continue <coughs> studying methods that enhance establishment. What kind of food can you provide? What kind of shelter? or overposition to enhance establishment. All right, that's my, my talk. Thanks for your attention. And also I would like to thank my colleagues. I work together with uh, these ladies, uh, Ada Lehmann, Chantal Lumat, Renate van Holstein. And I also collaborate a lot with uh, the University of Amsterdam, Mausa Belis and Arne Janssen. Thank you very much. Sometimes, why would you uh, 
if you control white light, for example, with a selected chemical, it might affect also the control of the other pest. So why not try to allow some low levels of pests when you are able to do this? It's a different story in ornamentals when the thresholds are really low for them. It's, it's a bit harder. So in that case, it's much more safer to try to promote them with alternative food sources. But yeah, it's, it's a different way of thinking of how to, to maintain these populations in your crop. How did, how did you feed the pollen? How did you present it so they could find it needed? Uh, also, they have this uh, machine. Well, the growers they have machines to blow it also in the crop. Yeah, it goes up to 10 meters. It's a strong wind, and then you just have a very low densities, very fine, uh, low densities of pollen. You can hardly see it, but uh, the pollen particles are there. So that's an easy method to provide it to bring it into your crop. Yeah. In our experiments, we just did it by hand, but but in, in practice, you can use machines. Yeah. Seems like the whole world is concerned about moving natural enemies around, especially generalist predators. So is it, is it, is it one of your slides you talk about, you know, search for new generalist predators. So, so what's, what's the situation in the Netherlands? It, in other words, if you found a generalist, you could use it in greenhouses. Is, it wouldn't be a regulatory concern yes. about bringing one in or? Yeah, you need, you need registration. Um, but uh, in the case of predatory mites, well, they don't fly, so it's also one of the criteria how well they spread or how well they survive in, the, in, in cold winters. So uh, diet pausing is, is important. Uh, so far, it was not really uh, an issue. I think most of the new natural enemies were, were allowed to use. Yeah. Yeah. One of your slides early on, you showed sort of the sterility of the greenhouses and that. I just started thinking, the inoculated releases that you're doing in that, is there ever any concern about introducing arthropoder and like biomass into the food supply with the natural enemies? Um, well, it's, yeah, it can happen, in the, especially when ornamentals, when they sell flowers and there are predatory mites walking around, mm -hmm. and then they can, can even be uh, negative for uh, people to, to control it, those. It should be clean for selling it, for exporting it. So, yeah, what sometimes happens, they just kill the natural enemies at the end of the season, uh, soon, shortly before harvest. And another problem in, in tomato, for example, these myriad predatory bugs are sometimes doing so well that at a certain level they cause some damage. And so they also have to spray against the natural enemies, yeah, just to uh, load down, slow down, the, to lower the densities a bit. Of the food processing itself, usually those animals are those animal parts or animals are excluded from the end product. Yeah. Though, right? Maybe occasionally it happens that they find a predatory bug mm -hmm. in a fruit, a pepper fruit or something, but not often no. It sort of goes along with what Sharon was asking, you know, the yeah. sort of counterintuitive effects and so on. Yeah. <coughs> okay, Herman mentioned he and I travel down to Watsonville tomorrow for a biocontrol greenhouse floriculture conference and it's always good for growers here to see what's going on in the Netherlands. I think maybe he's shocked to see what's happening and I think that's a good thing. So let's, uh, let's thank Herman for a nice presentation.